I'm, I'm delighted to welcome to All Souls Eric Larson, the author of this book, The People's Pension, The Struggle to Defend Social Security again, uh, Since Reagan. I'm, I'm eager to sort of get the message out about this issue uh, as widely as possible, and I'm hoping that, the, that the, the book can help me to do that. I wanted to take a really quick poll before I get started. I had to do a lot of research on public opinion polling about Social Security when I was writing this book. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and I want everybody who believes they want to answer yes to raise their hand. Um, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, you'll find out a little bit later in my talk what this is all about. But the question is, if you were told that Social Security could be secured, financially completely secured for the next 100 years, if you, uh, if you were to pay about half a percent more in payroll tax, would you want to do that, or would you not want to do that? Would you say, yes, I would pay that, or no? How many people would say yes? Okay, I think that's almost, almost universal. Okay, all right, so keep that, keep that thought in mind um, for a little bit later on. Uh, so basically, I'm here to talk about Social Security. Um, the book that I wrote, uh, which I'm told is a very large book, <laughs> is uh, it's basically a history of 30 years of the political debate about Social Security, going back to uh, the election of Reagan, actually going back a little bit before that. But that's the period when, uh, the way I look at the histories, that's really when the, the movement against Social Security, the movement to cut Social Security really kind of got into high gear, was with the election of Reagan. Um, and I wanted to just add a little bit to what David said in terms of why I decided to write this book is, is yeah, in the, the mid-90s I was running a magazine for pension executives, and, I, and that was the period when the whole idea of privatizing Social Security, the idea of, of splitting it up into individual accounts that uh, a worker could invest for himself or herself, and that would be the solution. We'd all get rich as personal investors. That idea was really kind of uh, first becoming a real hot item in Washington in the mid-90s. The stock market was booming, the economy was doing better, uh, and so, you know, why don't we all just get rich on Social Security payroll tax money? Um, and so I, I really was very, very interested in why this idea was suddenly such a hot thing. Um, Social Security is an incredibly popular program. It's arguably the most uh, popular social program in the history of this country and the most successful anti-poverty income support program this country's ever had. So uh, I was really kind of puzzled by why all of a sudden the attacks against it in Washington had become so relentless. And I thought as a, as a piece of political history this is interesting too because uh, essentially I think Social Security illustrates the gap between Washington and the rest of the country in terms of opinion, in terms of, uh, uh, of priorities, uh, you name it, more than almost any other issue out there. Uh, the, the, the discourse in Washington about Social Security is so different. The other reason I got interested, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is that I started to research the early roots of Social Security, where it came from philosophically, and I was surprised to find that rather than simply being a New Deal program that was cooked up by FDR and his advisors, Social Security is very profoundly different. It's not like any other program the federal government runs, with the possible exception of Medicare Part A. Um, Social Security really has its roots philosophically in um, 19th century European radicalism, in the movement for mutual aid, um, worker cooperation, and uh, it had, it, in fact, its origins had really very little to do with, with government running anything. And I got very intrigued by this, and I thought, well, what is, it, what is it fundamentally, philosophically, and what is there about it today that maybe retains some of that? You know, the germ of that, or, or, or whatever it was that really kind of uh, made people think of this thing back in the 19th century as something different. The third reason I wrote this book is really a personal reason, which is that as I got into working on it, and researching it, uh, I had to make a living. And I, I was not supported by any grant-making organizations or anything like that. And uh, as, as the economy had its ups and downs, I found, I found that uh, 
I was beginning to write something about something that was a little bit different than just Social Security. It was the, the movement against Social Security at a time when retirement is becoming very precarious in this country, when the beginnings of a retirement crisis were starting to develop in this country, which is m even more so today. And I can tell you, you know, I was, I was a freelance writer. Uh, my income was fluctuating. It took a plunge in 2008 after the crash. Uh, my IRA has been hit repeatedly by the dot-com bust, by the housing bust, and the market crash. Then, um, the house, the, my home equity is, you know, way down. Um, I'm in my early 50s. I'm trying to figure out how to retire too. And when I get the statement from Social Security, I have to get it online now. They don't send it to you in the mail anymore. That says, if you retire at 65 or if you retire at 70, here's how much you'll get. I think, well, I'm glad I'm at least I can at least count on that. So I'm very much in the same boat as the, the people that I'm writing about in this book, the people who, I'm writing the, who I wrote the book for, as opposed to the people I write about, and a lot of whom are politicians. So I have a lot of, uh, I, had, I suddenly found myself really writing about something that's a very life and death issue for me too. Um, so I guess uh, the question is then for me, when I was starting this, is why are there so many powerful people uh, who do not like Social Security uh, and want it to be phased out or to be, or to be privatized. What is it that's going on with this thing that they, that they don't like? And I guess um, I would start by giving you a little bit of a sort of top-down analysis, which is that there's kind of two sets of realities, I think, that we have in this country in terms of the way people look at things. Uh, one is related more to Washington and possibly to Wall Street, and the rest is, the other is related to the rest of us. Uh, the first reality is that the American population is aging. Uh, as a society, we're going to have to spend more to support the elderly in the decades ahead. That's just the way it is. If you have more older people, you're going to have to spend more money to take care of them. Um, we can reduce this slightly uh, here and there by doing some things more efficiently, like having maybe a real national health care system. Uh, but even then, the cost is going to go up. Uh, there's no getting around this. Someone's going to have to pay, whether it's all of us collectively through Social Security and Medicare, uh, or individually through our household resources. One way or the other, you can't, you can't cancel that, that, that future spending. You can only shift it. Um, that brings me to the second reality, which is that over the last 35 years or so, beginning really in the Carter administration, not the Reagan administration, but the Carter, uh, the 1%, which is the term that we, we use these days to refer to them, uh, have managed to construct a very favorable tax regime for themselves in this country. Um, low taxes, low income taxes for the top percentiles, estate taxes reduced radically, um, uh, capital gains and dividend taxes are way down. Um, and even though corporate taxes in the U.S. are fairly high, there's so many loopholes for big companies that they, a lot of times they wind up paying negative taxes instead of a, an actual corporate tax. I either get money back from the government. Um, and I would underscore this next statement. The foremost political objective of the 1% is to maintain and extend this system of low taxes for themselves. That is, to me, understanding that was one of the keys to being able to write this book and to understand what was going on, was this desire to, keep, was to, to drive taxes lower and keep them there and to forestall anything that would reverse that. Um, one thing that they have to do to accomplish this is to prevent government spending on the elderly from rising, uh, especially spending on Social Security and Medicare, because that means at some point higher taxes, and it would probably be higher taxes for them. Uh, the 1% don't want to be the ones footing the bill or any part of that bill. And so their objective with Social Security really is to shift the burden of old age spending from the social collectivity, meaning all of us, uh, to working households, i.e. the 99%. Uh, the problem, of course, is that many of the 99% can't afford to shoulder the burden of responsibility for caring for aged members of their extended families. So that's where the basic conflict is. You've got one small group of people who can pay and don't want to, and you've got a larger group of people who can't pay at all. Um, the first group exercised tremendous political power, and what I found in researching this book is that the second group can exercise uh, tremendous political power, 
and have at crucial times in the, in the period that this book covers. And that's the encouraging part of the story. Um, so the result is a sort of a political tug of war that's been played out over and over again in the period that I cover in The People's Pension. Um, it starts with a set of pro projections that the Social Security trustees put out every year predicting when Social Security will run out of money. These are projections, again, they're not facts, but they're projections 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future. This report is issued every year, every April, by the Social Security Administration. Every time it comes out, we hear uh, from the Republicans and the sort of center-right Democrats that we need to cut Social Security, it's not affordable, we've got to trim it down before it engulfs us. Uh, that we then get grassroots groups, including uh, labor unions, community activists, activists for the elderly, fighting off these demands uh, to restructure the program. And that involves reminding the public and the politicians again uh, what an important program Social Security is and how much it underpins the American middle class. So you have this debate which goes on in circles year after year after year in this 30 year period that I'm writing about. Um, just as, as an example, uh, why do we care? We care because Social Security is vital to us. As an example, Social Security keeps 20 million people every year out of poverty. Uh, Social Security is not a particularly generous program. A lot of these people are right, just barely on the right side of poverty, but it keeps 20 million people every year out of poverty. Uh, but there's more than that, actually. Two-thirds of the benefits from Social Security go to the elderly. That's usually what people are referring to when they say Social Security. Uh, but the rest goes to the disabled and to survivors, i.e. children, widows, widowers, uh, minor children, people uh, under the age of 18 uh, who've had a working parent die. Um, and that's still a lot of money. It's not too widely known. But Social Security, uh, by some estimates, is the most effective program in this country against childhood poverty. So that's how sweeping and how important it is to how many people. Um, yeah, let's see here. Is this going to work? Yeah. This is Paul Ryan. You, you know Paul Ryan? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you're going to have to look at him for a little while. Sorry about that. But um, Even Paul Ryan, head of the House Budget Committee and one of the biggest critics of Social Security, um, that's his fiscal blueprint from last year, which was going to reform entitlements out of existence. Uh, even he has admitted that his survivor's benefits when he was a teenager uh, allowed him to go to college. When one of his parents died, he saved up his survivor's benefits from the age of 15 or so, and it helped him to go to college. So uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how deeply into the social structure, into the community, Social Security extends. It's, it's very hard to find somebody who hasn't benefited from it in some way. Um, the other thing is, again, is contrary to popular belief, Social Security benefits are pretty modest. They only replace about 37% of the average worker's pre-retirement income at, four, at 65. More than 95% of recipients get less than $2,000 a month. The average is about $1,200. Nobody's, nobody's getting rich and exploiting the system off of Social Security. Uh, Social Security is actually one of the stingiest national old age benefit systems in the world. Compared to other industrialized countries, Social Security is way down on the scale. Um, but even so, it's a, basically a solid support for the middle class, not just for lower income people. Um, in fact, preserving Social Security protections was actually an element in the Occupy movement. Uh, one of the more interesting photos that I researched and uh, put in the book when I was um, uh, trying to get that section of it together was a photo from Fort Lauderdale of an Occupy Fort Lauderdale uh, action back in uh, late 2011, November, tw December 2011. And one of the signs said, leave Social Security alone. I mean, these were not, uh, uh, these were basically not elderly people either. These were uh, people in their working years, housewives and working mothers in their, in their working years, 30, 20s, 30s, and 40s, who realized that Social Security was something vital to them, and that's why they were there, was to say, don't cut it. Um, compare that with something that Mitt Romney said last year during his campaign uh, about entitlements. Uh, he said entitlements, including Social Security, are a fundamental corruption of the American spirit. Uh, I collected these quotes when I was writing the book, of course. 
John Tierney, who is a, a New York Times columnist, um, he once called Social Security a wonderfully intentioned system that in practice promotes greed and sloth. You know, that sloth line really got me. And then the one I really love is Thomas Saving, kind of an interesting name, who was a trustee of Social Security under the Bush administration. Uh, he had maybe the best line of all. He said, strange as it sounds, we must destroy the Social Security system as we know it in order to save it. It was like ch channeling General Westmoreland from the Vietnam War. I was amazed by that one. I mean, sometimes the cluelessness gets really too much. Um, so I guess uh, I wanted to get back just to the top level for a second and talk a little bit about um, the need for social security, not just the need for social security, but, but again, this philosophic basis. Where did it come from? Why do we have this thing? And what does it, you know, what does it mean on kind of a higher level? And um, so I, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a lightning history of, of where the idea of social security came from. Okay, this is Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Anybody know that name? Uh, he was a 19th century French anarchist, and he was the, was the first person who called himself an anarchist, but he was also the person who really kind of codified the idea of mutual aid. And he did this when he was in Paris, and he saw people from the part of con the country he came from pooling their resources. These were workers. They had no social protections of any sort factory workers, beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, and he saw them pooling their resources for burial benefits, for uh, widows' uh, benefits, for health benefits, pay for health care, in, in this very basic way, and he thought, this is not just something that these people are doing as a, as a, because they, can't, they don't have any other resources. This is maybe the germ of a whole other way to live, a whole other way to structure society. And that's where a lot of his thinking came from. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, burial a small burial benefit is actually part of Social Security today. That, comes, that, that really is a sort of a direct, a direct descendant of the, 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 the kinds of institutions that working people created for themselves in the mid 19th century. Um, let's see, oh yeah, uh, sorry about that. This is Ferdinand LaSalle, he was a German uh, statesman, mid 19th century, and he took the idea of mutual aid that Proudhon wrote about, and he said, well, why can't we do this as a part of government? Why can't government create a social insurance program where people pay into it, the government is a sort of trustee for it, and it creates a what he called a social insurance program that can pay benefits out to people who paid in. And uh, LaSalle was one of the founders of what later became the social, German Social Democratic Party. And so that's how the idea kind of found its way into sort of mainstream politics. Um, I'll get this right. <laughs> okay, this is Otto von Bismarck, and he took LaSalle's idea, and he developed in the 1880s a, uh, the first real social insurance programs in the world. Uh, first was a workman's comp program, 1881, followed by a national pension scheme. It was the first uh, of that sort. And it's interesting, actually, to read a statement that Bismarck made to the parliament when he introduced this idea uh, to think about how it may resonate today. Bismarck said that the state should interest itself to a, degrad to a greater degree than hitherto in those of its members who need assistance is not only a duty of humanity and Christianity, but a duty of state-preserving policy. These classes must be led to regard the state not as an institution contrived for the protection of the better classes of society, but as one serving their own needs and interests. The apprehension that a socialistic element might be introduced into legislation if this end were followed should not check us. Now, he would not be able to make a speech like that in the US Congress today, because the, 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 the notion that, that it was a socialist idea would be so overwhelming, it would almost be impossible to put it across. So 130 years, something odd years ago, that's how politics has changed. Um, the idea of social insurance caught on very, very quickly around the world after Germany started to introduce these programs. Uh, just FYI, the first uh, country in the Americas to introduce a national retirement system along social insurance lines was Uruguay in, I believe, 1911 or 1912. Uh, the United States was fairly slow uh, with this idea. So, sorry, I just keep doing this wrong. Okay, here we are. Um, 
the 1930s, uh, the United States was one of the few industrialized countries that didn't have some kind of national pension system. Uh, at the time, the, the situation of the elderly was almost an emergency. Something like two-thirds of people age 65 or over were unemployed. And this was a time when generally if you were that age you were expected to be employed. Uh, people like that had basically two things to fall back on. They had the county poorhouse or poor farm, which were uh, it still, evokes, it still evokes horrors today, and they were quite awful. Um, or you went to live with your family, who were probably unemployed and couldn't uh, really stand to support more members either. Uh, you want to see a good movie that was made back in those days about this whole problem. There's a movie called Make Way for Tomorrow, uh, 1938, which is a very good movie about a, a, a couple who ran out of their resources and were trying to live with their children. Um, so what happened is there was a mass movement. Uh, there were a number of organizations that got together, millions strong, the first time elderly people and their families organized in this country. Uh, there was one in particular called the Townsend Movement, which demanded a guaranteed income for everyone over 65. And those people would be required to spend all of it every month before they got their next 200 and something dollars. And the whole idea was, let's, let's support the elderly and let's get the economy going. This idea horrified mainstream politicians in Washington completely horrified them. And that was what gave the Roosevelt administration the nudge it needed to develop the Social Security Act, which FDR is signing here. So uh, what they did, what do we have then? We have Social Security, which is a social insurance program. It's something that, it's not welfare. It's something that's paid through by our payroll taxes. So it, it belongs to us. The, so, the federal government runs it in trust from us, but it belongs to us. Uh, in the 2000 presidential campaign, to jump up ahead just a second, uh, George W. Bush said something about how, made some gaffe during one of his speeches when he said, uh, the federal government wants to take your social security and run it themselves like it's a government program. And Al Gore immediately jumped on him and said, ha ha, George W. Bush doesn't understand that social security is a government program. But on a certain level, Bush was right. His, what his objectives were not correct, I don't think, which is to privatize it. But he was absolutely right that Social Security is not something that belongs to the government. It's something we own collectively. So that was the kind of system that was set up. And, uh, and, and there was an understanding of this at the time. Um, there was, when Social Security was set up, they, they, had, to, you, they had to do a cam amount of campaign to get employers to sign their workers up for payroll tax deductions. And so, there was a whole sort of PR campaign to get put together to get people to sign up for Social Security. And the posters and materials they did were fascinating. This is a poster that says, join the march to old age security. And it's playing off this whole idea of the mass movement, of the Townsend movement, the, the, the demand from the people for something like this. So you, it's, this, it sort of uses this idea of mass movement, something that belongs to all of us. Uh, at the same time, there was a, there were, they put out other things. Social Security is for the American family. It's not socialist. It's, this is not socialism. This is something that supports the family. It supports traditional American values. So you have an elderly woman. You've got uh, uh, presumably a widow and her child. These are the people whose Social Security is here to support. It's an all-American type of thing. Um, so we fast forward a little bit to the 80s. Um, Social Security was really, uh, again, uh, not something that conservatives or even a lot of people on sort of the, I guess what you call the center right, ever really totally supported. Uh, they had no choice in the early decades, and Social Security was improved be almost beyond recognition in its first 40 years of existence. Um, uh, finally, in the early 70s, Social Security was indexed to inflation. And that was a major, major change because really, uh, until the early 60s, Social Security actually didn't have much of an effect on the, the standard of living of the elderly. It was really in the, in, the, in the 60s when they started to index it regularly for inflation that Social Security uh, revolutionized the standard of living for elderly people in this country. The 60s and 70s were a time of a tremendous improvement. Um, and so you had suddenly a system that was able to really kind of pull millions and millions of people out of poverty. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would say that, and, and this gets back to our, uh, um, our poll earlier, uh, I studied 
public opinion polling on Social Security as far back as I could. And I found, uh, this is to give you an idea of just how, how uh, um, I guess I would say, just how well loved, for lack of a better word, Social Security is in this society. As far back as 1977, when people were asked, would you be willing to spend a little more money in your payroll tax to make sure that you could have Social Security? People said yes. Consistently, in every single poll since then, people have always been willing to pay a little more in payroll tax to support Social Security. In Washington, the idea, uh, the last time the payroll tax was raised for Social Security really was in 1983, and since then, the idea has been absolutely verboten in Washington. So again, this gap between uh, what is considered politically acceptable in Washington and what's considered politically uh, important in the rest of the country is just something that has grown and grown and grown. Um, I guess I would say, uh, first of all, uh, that what I tried to do in this book uh, was to trace a kind of a history of, of what's happened to Social Security since the 70s, since those improvements really kind of ground to a halt and Washington really started to think about ways to cut the program. Um, every single president, regardless of party, since Jimmy Carter has tried at least once in their presidency to cut Social Security. Uh, Reagan, this is Reagan and his budget director David Stockman, who developed a plan to radically cut Social Security benefits in 1981. Uh, they got their heads handed to them. They, uh, they lost uh, the, the 82 uh, Congressional election as a result was a disaster for them. Uh, they the Reagan administration in a way never really recovered from. Um, <clears throat> oh, now just what happened here. Aha. <coughs> Bill Clinton uh, tried to cut Social Security in, uh, well, Bill Clinton actually uh, intended for uh, cutting Social Security and cutting entitlements to be the domestic policy centerpiece of his second administration. Um, and what happened, uh, he, he uh, was working on a deal with Newt Gingrich to uh, engineer a sort of a grand bargain on uh, cutting entitlements. And of course the Lewinsky scandal caught up with him and that more or less forced him back into the arms of the progressive Democrats who he was, uh, had been planning to blow off on this issue. Uh, and so that essentially ended that threat. George W. Bush in uh, 2005, after his reelection, poured most of his political capital into an attempt to uh, sell Social Security privatization to the public with a 60 day, cities in 60 days tour. Uh, the idea was that the public would then demand of Congress that it give them private Social Security accounts. Uh, it didn't work out. His popularity seemed to drop every single time he opened his mouth on the subject and he had to call it off in fall of 2005. Um, so that was one, another attempt. Barack Obama in 2011 uh, got together with uh, Republican members of Congress and came very close to making a deal that would have raised the retirement age on Medicare and would have uh, changed the consumer price index that's used to calculate Social Security benefits, replaced it with a stingier measurement that would have lowered the value of Social Security gradually over time. Uh, this idea didn't happen for one very interesting reason, uh, because the Tea Party Republicans didn't think it went far enough. The progressive Democrats couldn't stop it. They were isolated. Uh, uh, Pelosi and uh, Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi, the, Republic the Democratic leaders in Congress, were prepared reluctantly to go along with it. It was, it was uh, Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan and those folks who said, no, this is not enough, we want more. And that was what really shot it down. So this is the kind of, of uh, weird twists of fate that, that, that pop up over and over again in this story. Um, so I guess the question, but the question is, this has been a persistent thing through, for 30, 30 plus years now that this, uh, these efforts to cut Social Security keep getting beaten back. On the other hand, it hasn't been possible for 30 years now to do anything to improve Social Security. My thesis is that a program like Social Security has to keep up with the changing needs of the people it serves. If it doesn't, 
it atrophies, it stops being relevant. Uh, where are the social security benefits for same-sex partners, for example? Where are the social security benefits for other kinds of unconventional households? Uh, the minimum benefit under social security is too low to support people who've worked at minimum wage jobs their whole lives, which is a growing section of society. Uh, why isn't anything being done for these people? It's because every time anybody attempts to bring it up, somebody says, well, Social Security's going broke. We, we can't afford it. We just can't afford it. And so Social Security has been stalled in its tracks. And I would submit that on the one hand, it hasn't been possible politically to cut it, which is a huge frustration to Republicans and to center-right Democrats. On the other hand, progressives have not been able to improve it. And that is as, almost as big a problem in the long run, in my view, uh, as the fact that, that, that people are, are attempting to cut it year after year after year. Um, so one of the reasons, why is it constantly under attack? Well, one reason is because of the uh, political dynamic that I've talked about. Another is because there's, a, there's been a kind of a culture war against Social Security that's been going on for this entire 30-year period that's, that's, that I, I try and talk about in the book as well. Um, this is a magazine cover of New Republic. This was in 1988, and this was the first time that phrase greedy geezers appeared that I've been able to document. Uh, it, it crops up over and over again, this, these, these sort of oldsters coming out of their gated communities with their golf clubs and their garden tools to rob the younger generation. They're going to rob the people in their teens and 20s who need money. You know, it's th this idea that, that, uh, the, that the elderly are the, uh, are, are the real culprits in society. And this, this is an idea that was promoted by uh, mainstream, sort of by a number of mainstream Washington publications. It was promoted particularly by a guy named Pete Peterson, who is a uh, Wall Street banker, very wealthy, who's made it a kind of a hobby horse of his to push for cutting in entitlements. And he's been doing this since the early 80s. Uh, it, and he's funded publications, he's funded uh, scholars and uh, think tankers for years to push this idea. Uh, and the result is this kind of thing. Um, the people, I've read the actual article, the people who were quoted in it, this is 1988, the experts and economists, are all people who've moved in Peterson's circle at one time or another. Um, ah, sorry. Okay, sometimes it gets funny. Uh, the, the, the coverage of Social Security gets so weird sometimes because of this distorted idea that Social Security is something that's going to go broke, that you see this, this sort of thing in what used to be one of my favorite publications, the Weekly World News. Um, Mast whistleblower is going, you know, rocks Washington the story of how Social Security is going to be secretly cut. Um, you can get this on a t-shirt, by the way. If you contact, they don't publish anymore, but they still sell t-shirts, so you can get a t-shirt. Uh, but you know, it's, it's funny, but on the other hand, it, it, the, the, the sort of coverage that we get prevents us ha from having a serious conversation about what we really need to do, which is to improve Social Security and, and, and make it into more of a, of, a, of a robust retirement system. Instead, we get these sort of, either we get uh, 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 a discussion which is premised on how can we cut it, or we get sort of silliness. So uh, I guess the... the uh, the question is, why do, we, <laughs> why do we still have Social Security after all of this onslaught? And the, and the reason we have Social Security is because of this. Because uh, the other side of the story is that for 30 plus years, there are a number of organizations and a lot of activists that have been very, very good at getting out there whenever the, 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 the issue reaches a critical stage. Uh, the Grey Panthers, the uh, Alliance, uh, Alliance, American Alliance of Senior Citizens, uh, National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. There's a number of groups that have been absolutely heroic over the years. And one of the nicer things about, my, about the story I tell in my book is that I was able for the first time to really kind of get in and tell the story of, of the other side, of the people who've been defending it all these years. Um, this was a rally in San Francisco back in 2010 when the Simpson-Bowles Commission, which Obama appointed, was concocting its plans to cut Social Security. And these people were out every place that commission met, every time they met, um, raising awareness. And this is absolutely vital. It goes on over and over again. Um, these sorts of rallies are accompanied by floods of email, uh, floods of letters, 
and, uh, and, and visits to members of Congress, <clears throat> and a very active effort to let lawmakers know that in a pinch they had better not support, they had better not vote against Social Security. So uh, if you want to get active on this kind of thing, see me, because I encourage everybody to. This is, this is what really keeps it alive. So uh, the question is, where are we with Social Security today? Because my talk is about so the war against Social Security, the inside story. So I'm going to tell you about that now. Um, where we stand today, uh, beginning of the second Obama administration, after the debt ceiling crisis in December, in the middle of the uh, this manufactured sort of sequester crisis today, uh, we have a, a president who's eager to make some kind of a deal uh, that would cut Social Security in some way that to him, I think, would be symbolic. To a lot of the rest of us, it would be a lot more serious than that. We have a Washington establishment, including a national press corps, uh, that takes for granted that Social Security is unaffordable, despite plenty of evidence that it's not. Um, we've got Republicans in control of the House who insist that uh, uh, not only on uh, cutting entitlements, but that the Democrats go first with it in order to protect them from having to pay the consequences. And we've got a Senate that's controlled by a very divided Democratic Party. The largest single caucus in the uh, Democratic caucus in, in Congress actually is the Progressive Caucus, but it's isolated. Uh, Washington politics has really become a kind of a dialogue when it comes to issues like this between the Republican right and the Democratic center right. Is how can we achieve this harmonic convergence where we will, uh, where we will cut the deficit and we will uh, make, uh, in, we will tame entitlements and do all these wonderful things so that the nation can get back to private enterprise again. It's uh, basic, uh, not, uh, they're fairly nonsensical ideas and they tend to fall apart when you look at them closely, but that's, that's the real discussion in Washington. That's the, the discussion that's covered in the national media every day. Um, progressives are pretty much marginalized. So uh, you have this kind of this kind of dialogue between these two groups and the rest of us are kind of left out. Um, so the debate about the sequester, how does Social Security figure into that? Well, there's two ideas that are being touted as ways to uh, balance the budget or uh, cut the deficit over the next 10 years that involve Social Security. One of them is raising the Medicare retirement age from 65 to 67. Now, that doesn't directly affect Social Security, but the fact of the matter is that if Young, if, if younger retired people were still having to spend several years uh, uh, without Medicare, they're going to have to pay more out of pocket for health care in any case. That cuts into their Social Security. Uh, people are already spending quite a bit of their Social Security check on health care effectively. Uh, this cuts in even further. It, 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 people are more constrained with, with every other thing that they have to pay for on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the second thing, of course, is the, what's known as the chained CPI, and that's this uh, stingier consumer price index that I referred to other, uh, earlier. Almost every part of the Washington establishment seems to accept that the chained CPI has to be part of any deal. Uh, Obama's press secretary just about a week ago gave a, uh, a briefing in which he said that the chained CPI is very much on the table. He's very emphatic about it. Uh, so that's something I think everybody needs to know and needs to be maybe getting in touch with the White House about and saying this is not a good idea. Um, but I wanted to actually use maybe the, uh, just the next few minutes before we can do questions and so forth to talk a little bit about the chain CPI because I think this is a very bad idea and I think it brings up a lot of issues that I try and raise in this book about the larger picture of what uh, Americans, especially people heading into retirement, are facing. Um, Chain CPI, there's been efforts in Washington to tinker with the consumer price index for about 50, at least 15 years now as a, way to, as a way to create a sort of a magic bullet that will lower the cost of things like Social Security. The chain CPI is sort of the latest version of it. And how it works is very simple. Is the idea is that uh, the cost of living yardstick, the CPI, uh, doesn't take into account um, 
all the price incre all the substitutions people make when price increases happen. That if 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 uh, beef is too expensive, people will buy chicken. If you know. Uh, uh, organic vegetables are too expensive, people will buy other kinds of vegetables. And that people make these substitutions so that when the price of beef goes up, you don't automatically have to count that into the CPI. And if you don't count it into the CPI enough times, the CPI starts to lag. Okay, it starts to lag. Um, what does that mean for elderly people? Well, uh, it means that basically you can't maintain your standard of living. You might, have, you might be getting a little bit more money each month or each year from Social Security, but not enough to keep up with the cost of living. And so it would be as though uh, somebody who was retired in 1940, uh, as, as though you were still getting the same amount of money or effectively an equivalent amount to what somebody, a retiree was getting in 1940. It wouldn't make any sense. But that's the direction it would go in. If you institute something like the chain CPI, over a period of decades, Social Security would become irrelevant. It would become too small to be a significant part of anybody's income. Now, this is very important because uh, one of the pieces of wisdom that, uh, that critics of Social Security have shared among themselves for many years is that if you, want to, if you want to reform Social Security, you don't do something that will affect retirees today. You do something that will affect them maybe in 10 years and something where the, the real, but the, where the real cost will be borne by the next generation so that you can get over this problem of activist seniors who call their, who vote and call their members of Congress and complain and you lay it off onto the younger generations who aren't really focused on this issue yet. That politically has always been the way they talk about doing it. Okay, so uh, the chain CPI. Um, what does it actually mean in quantitative terms? There are no thorough studies of the actual impact of the chain CPI, uh, but something of the impact can be understood from the following. Two-thirds of people over, social, over 65 receiving Social Security today rely on it for over half of their total household income each year. Three-quarters of these people are non-married women. Over 13 million Americans depend on Social Security for over 90% of their income. Uh, so what you take away from that is basically this is that there's no such thing as a small technical correction to Social Security, which is what they try to pass the chain CPI off as. It's a technical correction. We're actually paying people too much, so we're going to correct it so that we're paying them the right amount. Well, you can say that, but people are going to experience that as a cut. And over time, it's going to be a very significant cut, and it is going to throw millions of people into poverty. That is the reality. The other reality is that uh, younger people today who will bear the brunt of the cost of something like the chain CPI, um, those people are go actually going to need Social Security more than people do today. Uh, people in their 20s and 30s today are burdened by student debt. They're burdened by mortgages if they can actually get a mortgage. Uh, the uh, uh, wages in this country have stagnated for the better part of the last 40 years with a few periods of exception. Uh, they've stagnated even more, even gone down in the last three or four years. Um, uh, if you're a young person today, the cost of health care is almost prohibitive. Uh, essentially, we're talking about a generation or a couple of generations of people who haven't been afford to, uh, able to afford to save. Uh, result is they're going to depend on Social Security more than people do today, if, uh, if anything. And yet, they're going to be the ones who are going to bear the brunt of the cuts in Social Security that would be uh, uh, brought about by the chain CPI. Okay, so the problem here is that, uh, uh, well, I should actually say the irony of this is that the point of the chain CPI, of course, really is to cut the deficit, is to cut Washington spending. Um, the chain CPI is, expect, is projected to save something like $220 billion over the next 10 years. Um, this is this is actually a drop in the bucket in terms of actually cutting the, the deficit over the next 10 years. Um, and the fact is that uh, doing it, because most of the savings, again, are much further out. They're decades into the future. Um, I think the real point of this is for uh, the administration and for Congress to send a signal to Wall Street that, yes, we're prepared to get tough on entitlement. So it's a, it's a kind of a symbolic thing for them. For the rest of us, again, it's not symbolic at all. Um, okay, Social Security cuts were left out of the 
uh, the fiscal cliff deal that was uh, concluded at the end of the year. Um, that doesn't mean the administration isn't willing to make a deal. Uh, the only reason they didn't was because the White House essentially had to cede control of the negotiations to the Senate Democratic leadership in which progressives had a bit of a stronger voice and were more resistant to the idea. Um, uh, but the ironic thing is that under the deal that was passed, the, uh, what they called the Taxpayer uh, Relief Act, um, is that the flow of guaranteed income from Social Security is going to loom even larger as a factor in the economic recovery because so much of the stimulus money uh, that, was, that Obama passed in 2009 and even some of the elements of the safety net are still at risk. Uh, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the deal that was made in December and January. Um, it extended unemployment insurance, but only temporarily. Uh, it allowed the partial payroll tax holiday, which we had for a couple of years, to expire and didn't replace it with anything else. A uh, series of tax cuts for lower income households were also extended, but only for five years. Uh, amazingly, people making less than $113,000 $113, a year, that is the bottom 98% of the population, are actually going to see a larger increase in their tax rates than the top 1% of people will. Um, as a result of that deal. Uh, the advantageous rates that the Republicans earned for their supporters in the Bush tax cuts are mostly permanent now, not temporary. Um, I bring this up because I think that the deal that was made uh, by Obama in December and January was fairly disastrous in a lot of ways. Um, a host of discretionary programs, um, the WIC nutrition program for women and infants, low income, home energy assistance, rental ho housing assistance for the poor are all still on the chopping block. Um, and what we're going to be hearing over the next few months is that, social, is that we've got a zero sum game, that if we don't cut Social Security and Medicare, we're going to have to cut these other things. So it's again this sort of pitting the generations against each other, this idea that Social Security is somehow uh, robbing younger generations and robbing working people today of the seed corn to, to build a better economy. We're going to hear this over and over again as the sequester st debate starts to really heat up. Um, so all of this, I think, underscores what I consider to be a very stark reality. A uh, retirement crisis is mounting fast in this country. Uh, home equity, employer-based pensions, personal savings, uh, which used to be ingredients in a working person's old age planning have eroded frighteningly. Uh, new burdens are falling on elderly people in the form of higher health care costs, cost of helping out their struggling children and grandchildren. Social Security, um, despite all of the attempts to portray it as an out of control entitlement, is the one element of retirement income that most Americans can still count on. If anything, Washington should be looking for ways to expand it into a true national retirement system rather than a supplement to private pensions and other assets, which is what it's been for most of its history. And there are proposals out there now to double the size of Social Security benefits uh, that, are, that are fairly plausible, and there's even, there's even scenarios set up for how to pay for it, uh, which are plausible and don't, even, don't really increase the deficit. Um, these are the kinds of things we should be looking at now, is how to improve Social Security rather than how to cut it further or how to uh, keep it from um, destroying younger generations of this other sort of wacky stuff. Um, if Washington goes the other way, if the right and the center right achieve this sort of harmonic convergence that they've been aiming at for a long time, then first of all, we'll see deeper and more disastrous uh, recessions in decades to come. Because larger and larger portions of the population, especially the elderly, are going to be put at risk. Suddenly, we're going to have a lot more people who are depending on their families, who are depending on local communities for relief. Again, you can shift these costs, you can't cancel them, unless you literally want to make people starve. Um, that's all right on a certain level with people in the conservative camp because they believe that these, this, that these kinds of benefits should be welfare. They should be something that is easy to cut, not something that people feel an ownership of like they do with Social Security. And so that's what I want to sort of close on, um, is that Social Security is something that we should feel is something that belongs to us. It's not something that's simply granted to us as a benefit or as a favor by government. It's something we earned, something belongs to us, it's something that's held in trust for us. And if we sort of keep that idea in mind, 
when we read the newspaper, first of all, it'll, it'll clarify things a lot. And secondly, I'm hoping it'll get more and more people out into the streets to put real pressure on government. So uh, I, hope that's, I hope that's something I can encourage everyone to do, and thanks for listening. Well, Simpson and Bolazar. Simpson is a, was a, a Republican senator from, uh, from Wyoming who, whose main job in Congress was to dump Social Security. Yeah. Secondly, Bowles is a, it, it's a, was a, a, a conservative Republican, a conservative Democrat, no, right, right. who is a lobbyist now for big business. How did Obama, President Obama, manage to appoint these two guys <laughs> to head the committee right. That's supposed to save us. Well, Erskine Bowles was also uh, Bill Clinton's chief of staff. And he uh, said, literally, that the reason he stayed on in the uh, Clinton administration after Clinton was reelected was he, because he felt that there was a chance to reform entitlements. Uh, Simpson is a, a longtime Washington hand. He's, uh, he served, uh, I think, three or four terms in the Senate. And he, was sort of a, and he was known as somebody who bucked the Republican Party occasionally on some issues. And so Obama, in his great desire to appear bipartisan, uh, appointed uh, Alan Simpson, who cares about entitlements, as, one, as, as, as his wrong. Republican co-chair, and Bowles, because Bowles is a very influential member of the Democratic Party establishment. I'm sure Bowles lobbied for the position very, very strongly. Uh, that's, it's, was, it's inside Washington politics is the short answer to your question, uh, is that the, the desire to appear bipartisan and then also uh, the desire to stay within the kind of establishment ambit of Washington, not to go outside, not to go off the reservation, to stay within the... That is the answer. I didn't hear you mention a change that President Clinton made in Social Security. Up until that time, people had not been able to earn more than a certain amount of right. money mm -hmm. and uh, to continue to receive Social Security. If they made more than that, that was it. But under Clinton, he said you can earn as much as you like and you can still collect Social Security. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, that was, of course, that was a good thing to do. Uh, that, was the, that was really the... Clinton did two things in terms of Social Security. Number one is, as part of the uh, uh, fiscal plan that he pushed through Congress the first year he was elected, Social Security benefits started to be taxed. Uh, people who were upper, or upper income earners started to pay tax uh, on their Social Security benefits. The second thing he did was there had actually been a succession of bills passed prior to, to 2000, which raised the amount of money that you could earn even after you started collecting Social Security. Clinton in 2000 passed a bill essentially abolished any limit on that. Now that was a good thing to do. Uh, I have no problem with that because more and more people who are on Social Security need to earn some extra money. But let's put this in context a little bit. By the time he passed that bill, the limit had been raised so far that the actual percentage of people who were affected by that particular bill that Clinton passed was minuscule. We're talking in the low hundreds of thousands literally were, were affected by the fact that they no longer had this limit. And I, I, again, it wasn't a bad thing to do, but I point this out because, again, it has been so difficult to actually improve Social Security over the last 30 years that that was the one thing that they were able to do to actually improve Social Security to some extent. And it, it, it really speaks volumes, the degree of, of, of difficulty with even getting people in Washington to entertain the idea that Social Security might need to be enhanced in some way, that that was the only thing they were able to accomplish during those years. My understanding is that Social Security which was set up to be the contributions were to go into a special trust fund. Mm -hmm which shouldn't have had any impact on the deficit. And right. the Lyndon administration to uh, you know, uh, fight the, continue the Vietnam War, he then added that money to the General Trust Fund. So in effect, really, Social Security should not, you know, it, it should be paying for itself when they have borrowed so much money from the Trust Fund. Well, this is, this is a very long and convoluted subject. It's, it's a difficult one, but I think I can bring down to the, to the relevant details, is that uh, when Social Security was first set up, the idea was to have 
a trust fund that would build up that would be off budget. The, the payroll taxes were set high enough so that a fairly large amount of money would accumulate in there. That idea was actually, a couple of years after that began, Republicans actually pushed to get rid of it. They said that if Social Security built up a large trust fund, it would have to start buying stocks and bonds, and it would start to control American business, and you would have a sort of pension fund socialism. And so they said it should only be allowed to invest in treasury bonds, so that they started buying treasury bonds. That happened in 1939. So after that, you had a trust fund, but they cut the payroll taxes so that a large amount of money wouldn't build up. It was so that it would only produce really as much as was needed to pay every year. But Social Security was, was declared to be off budget which meant that you couldn't add the, the Social Security's books in with the rest of the federal budget every year. It was considered separate. Now, when Johnson was president, uh, he wanted to find a way to sort of fudge things so that he could pay for, his, pay for his war in Vietnam. And one of the things they did was to declare Social Security on budget so that uh, money coming into Social Security could be used to sort of make it look like the federal budget was a little bit more balanced than it was. Um, there, were a whole, there was a whole series of gyrations over this that happened in the 80s. And Social Security was finally declared to be off budget. It's off budget today. But it's really kind of a technical distinction because, when, because again, Social Security the trust fund, there's about $2.3 trillion in it now. And it's invested in treasury bonds. And so when they actually do calculations of the federal debt, uh, there are two measurements that are used. One of them includes the treasury bonds in the trust fund. The other one doesn't. Uh, and so it's possible for people to use those numbers in all kinds of weird ways, and which they do in Washington. They're, 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 used to, they're, they're stood on their heads. They're, they're turned upside down. They're, all kinds of things are done with them. And that's where it gets weird. But I think the key thing to remember is that um, the Social Security Trust Fund is invested in treasury bonds. And those have the full faith and credit of the United States government, just like the treasury bonds that the Bank of China or the Bank of Japan or Goldman Sachs has. Well, if it wasn't invested in, in treasury bonds, what would you invest it in? Would you want it to buy uh, housing developments? <laughs> I don't know. I think that people who criticize that arrangement, and there are things to criticize about it. What they really aim at is to say, the government can't do anything acceptable with this money, so it should be privatized and put into private accounts. And that becomes kind of the part of the rationale for that whole thing. So the, there's a lot of twists and turns to this. Are you familiar with a book written by Ellen Brown called The Web of Debt? Because that, The Web, the web of Debt, right? That's the, the title? That clarifies who's actually creating the money and how it's created. The way it's created is, is not to provide for the, for the 99%. It's really for the, the 1%. And it's been, it's been contrived this way since the beginning of this country. I think any form of Chase CPI will be passed in the next <coughs> year or two. And is there anybody that actually does get a return on what they put in initially. I did some calculations, I've worked all my life, and there's just no way I'm gonna be getting half of what I put, put in. It, put into Social Security? Yeah. In terms of whether the chain CPI can pass, strangely for me, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about this. I think it's gonna be very hard for them to make a deal, uh, because I think, I think basically, the Obama administration and the Republicans are too far apart on too many issues. And the chain CPI, it's, it, it's now fairly well known, the implications of it. If they weren't so par far apart on other issues, this is something they could probably make a deal on. Unless people are really active and really, really hit their uh, lawmakers hard, it could happen anyway. It would have to be packaged with too many other things which they're too far apart on. But that doesn't mean they won't try. Okay, uh, the other question was whether, you, whether one gets a return on Social Security. One, of the, one thing to keep in mind is that when you put your money into a private investment, you pay management fees for it, whether it's a mutual fund or a unit trust or anything like that, you pay, you pay fees. Um, Social Security, the fees you pay are something like 1% because the cost of administering it is very, very low. There is no highly paid money managers or hedge fund managers involved or anything like that. No complicated bookkeeping. And so 
Uh, there are some calculations which say that, that you actually do get a pretty good return on Social Security, not because Treasury bonds produce such a great return, but because of two things. First of all, the, the lack of fees, and second of all, the fact that it is inflation indexed. And that's something that it would cost you a fortune to buy that with any other investment. You can do it, but it'll cost you a fortune. And it's that inflation protection over a period of however long you're retired, 10, 20, 30 years, that's really, really key. As far as debt, you know, I mean, that's, that's too big a subject for me to answer in, in two seconds. But let me turn it around just briefly, and I don't want to get onto another subject, but if you want to understand debt, you have to look at the flip side of it, which is credit. What advantage do people in the 1% have over the rest of us? It's not that they have more money. Lots of people have lots of money at any given time. It's the fact that they get, that their credit is good. Their credit is better than ours. If you are Bank of America and you screw up in 2008 and you're technically insolvent, your credit is good. You will be, you will be made whole. You will be allowed to continue. Uh, if, it's, if it's me, probably not. Uh, and so I think that it's, I think that in a way this is a, it, it, in a way it's, it's not so much a financial issue, it's a political issue, is why are certain classes of people considered to be worthy of bailout and worthy of credit and other people aren't. That to me is the beginning of that discussion, which is something I'm beginning to have with myself a lot more seriously. It seems to me that the cap on the payroll tax, if it were raised, would bring in more money. What, what are the advantages and disadvantages to that? I don't hear anybody talking about it. Well, yeah, that's Bernie that's. Sanders does. Yeah, yep. uh, so Bernie Sanders talks about it a lot. Yeah, there's a limit now. It's about $113,000 a year on the amount of your income that is taxed for payroll tax. Okay, if you make $120,000, you pay the same amount of tax as of payroll tax as if you made $113,000. If you make $2 million, you pay the same amount of payroll tax as if you made $113,000. The reason for this is that the benefits are tied to, to some extent to how much money you pay in. And somebody making, uh, Social Security is not set up to pay benefits on $2 million. So it's, it's supposed to be a base income for ordinary working people. So there is a reason for keeping a cap up to a certain level, but it's, it's way less than it was. 20 years ago, 90% of income, total income, was taxed for, for Social Security. Now it's down to about 82%. If it was raised back to 90%, which is a fair figure, Social Security would be bringing in a lot more money. So I support the idea of, of raising the cap. I would say this, though, that the real way to restore Social Security's finances, and its finances aren't in that bad shape now to begin with, unless you believe the worst scenarios. The main problem is wage stagnation. Is since, the since the mid 70s, we've had wage stagnation in this country Real way, in real terms, except for a brief period in the late 90s when the economy was doing better. The result of this, you have lower um, real income, you have lower payroll tax receipts. Lower payroll tax receipts, Social Security trust fund isn't as healthy. The best thing you could do for Social Security would be to give everybody a raise, would be to get wages rising at a reasonable rate again. That would be the best thing you could do. You could raise the cap, but if you could get wages going up again, you could take care of a, substantially the rest of it. In response to your query about why some people are, you know, worthy of credit and some not, Warren Buffett has answered that. that <laughs> right. The class war is over and they won. <laughs> right. If you keep that in mind, because it's really, there's a truth in that, then it clarifies a lot of things. Um, the other thing is that I think there's a little bit of a misconception. I agree with you about wages, but um, up until the 70s, from, from the end of the war, World War II, we didn't have the kind of international competition. You know, we thought that we were doing it all ourselves. We made the best cars in the world, we made everything, and everybody paid what we asked for. But part of that was because other countries didn't have any means of making anything. So we didn't have competition and it was a little bit of an unreal time. So when we go back to that, well, we should have everybody's wages should go up and it hasn't since the 70s, we're in a different world. And I think we need to find ways to deal with this world. You know, there is no magic thing that says, yeah, sure, wages go up. Well, exactly how are we doing that? Nobody knows. 
Well, that's a complicated question as well. Uh, but, but again, it's, it's very relevant for this discussion because, yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, sure. But, but well, but it, I'm always asking myself questions, so you got me going. It's true. Is that there was a, this that the 40s, 50s, and 60s were kind of an exceptional period for the American economy. But other countries, other industrialized countries, have done a better. Well, two things. First of all, globalization, uh, globalized economy, is not something that just happened. It was something that s decisions were made that pitted American workers against workers in other countries. The, those were fairly deliberate decisions that were made in Washington uh, in the 70s, the 80s, and beyond. So. It's not something that just happened. Number two, other industrialized countries have managed this period much better than this country has. That uh, Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries, other countries that have, a, have had a more social democratic system, uh, the countries where social insurance began, interestingly enough, uh, have figured out ways to prevent mass layoffs or discourage companies from doing mass layoffs to have more of a partnership with labor so that they've been able to manage this, peri this period of change in a way that doesn't just really throw workers to the dogs. This country has, had, has, has dealt with it in a very severe way. There are ways that we could learn from countries in the old Europe that have, have managed to sort of negotiate this period much better. I think that introducing the euro was a disastrous thing to do. <laughs> but um, in other ways, they've been able to kind of uh, maintain a lot of social solidarity without becoming uncompetitive. And uh, this country, for political, for complicated political and social reasons, has taken a very, very different route, uh, which has been very damaging. So I think, I'm just saying that to put it in context a little bit. I was uh, wondering whether there's any um, study done on the fact that there are, if, there, if all the illegal immigrants are going to become legal, wouldn't we get a lot of uh, social security from them? And uh, that's one question. And the other is, uh, when people in the red states uh, say that they don't like the idea of social security, uh, does anybody return it, like send it back? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, a couple of years ago, there was a group of fairly wealthy degrees who got together and created a little organization where they were urging people in their income group to give back their social security or to give it to charity or something like that because we don't need it. There must have been about a handful of them in actual numbers. They got a lot of publicity and, and then I heard nothing about it after that. I think it was a pretty small group. Since, since 1990, if you poll people on their concerns about perhaps being poor in retirement, it's amazing. It goes way up into the most affluent sectors. If you, if you dice up the results by income level, everybody is afraid, unless you're uh, Warren Buffett, everybody is, everybody is afraid of losing everything. And, and this is, I think, I think, really a kind of a cultural driver in our society now, really, is fear that we're always living in this constant state of precarity. And so I think you could go pretty high up into the income levels, but you won't find a lot of people who want to give back their Social Security because somewhere in the back of their mind they think they may just need it, and that's why they call it social insurance. What about the means test? Sometimes people talk about that <clears throat> as, a, as, as a strategy for dealing with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> means testing is something that actually polls fairly well. It's one of the few things in terms of cutting Social Security that actually polls fairly well because it seems on the surface like it's a fair thing to do. If you don't need it, why can't, you, uh, why can't you basically take a cut in your benefits? Well, what I just said I think answers part of that is that, is that um, this concern about, uh, about uh, where you'll be as a retiree, is, is, uh, anything can happen. And I think it's especially with health care costs the way they are. And I think a lot of people are, are coming to understand that. The second thing, the more important issue though, is that means testing Social Security erodes the social solidarity element in the program. Uh, if you're not getting uh, the modest amount of money that you're getting from Social Security, you don't feel like it's something that you have uh, a stake in. Uh, it's something that is dispensable. And, you're, and in a very real sense, you're turning Social Security into more of a welfare program. If it's, that's the definition of a, of a welfare program. It's something, it's, it's benefits you get because your income is down to a certain level. And if Social Security was treated the same way, it would essentially be a welfare program. And I've seen explicit 
very explicit uh, uh, strategy statements and, and analyses from places like the Cato Institute where they pretty much come out and said this, that what we need to do is turn it into a welfare program because then we can cut it. Then it's politically acceptable to cut it because what happens to welfare programs in this country? They get cut. That's one thing we know politically over the last 30 years. Can you tell us how solvent or insolvent is the Social Security Fund? Um, mm -hmm. For those people who have worked and paid into it, is that money that we paid there, mm -hmm. or is it not there? Are we dependent on future workers paying in so that we would get paid back? And if it is insolvent, um, how can it be fixed? Number one, uh, it is there in the sense that there is a trust fund and it's got treasury bonds in it, which are full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So there are assets there that the United States is obliged to honor. As far as solvency, uh, there are three estimates that the Social Security trustees put out every year. There's the upper end estimate, there's the intermediate estimate, and then there's the lower estimate. One is fairly optimistic, one is more in the middle, and the other is fairly pessimistic. Now, the intermediate projection is the only one that the media pays any attention to every year because it's considered to be the most plausible uh, projection. And that projection says that Social Security Trust Fund will be able to pay all benefits until I believe the latest, the latest figure was 2032, which is a little less than 20 years from now. After that, it'll have enough money to pay 75% of benefits. And so Congress would have to either Cut, pay, cut Social Security payments. By law, Social Security cannot take any money other than what's in the trust fund. It cannot take general revenues. You can't pump money into Social Security. It has to pay for itself. So Congress would have to do one of two things. It would have to cut benefits so that it could stay within its budget, or it could raise payroll taxes, which would mean that you know uh, it, could, it could pay the full benefits. First of all, these are projections. And, I, and there are some studies, including by uh, an actuary da named David Langer, who's a friend of mine. Actually, over the past 25 years, the intermediate projection has actually been very pessimistic, that the, the upper end optimistic projection has actually been more accurate. And that projection says that Social Security will have enough money to support uh, us for 75 years and even beyond. So it depends on which projection you believe. And, there, and, and I could go into another half hour in terms of what the elements of those projections are and so forth. But the first thing to keep in mind is number one, that that's all they are. There's been periods where the projections have tended to be more pessimistic, periods when they've been more optimistic. And that gets to the next point you made, which is are we, are we depending on our children and grandchildren to support us? And the answer is yes, that's always what we've been doing with Social Security. It's a, it's a generational compact is, is the idea. Uh, so there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with that. This question of whether younger people are being ripped off by Social Security is, I mean, I think it's basically a red herring that if you're young and you're paying into it now, it may seem like a big chunk out of your paycheck, but by the time you're 65, 67 years old, it's going to seem like a, like a pretty good uh, deal. Um, I think that uh, to go into this any deeper would require much more time. <laughs> but let me just say that that's really the ba the 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 the, the um, frustrating part of the Social Security debate is that it's circular because it's always about something that's going to happen 10, 20, 30 years in, into the future. And if we keep obsessing about that, we stop thinking about what we can do to help the elderly today, for example, or to help the economy today, which is ultimately what supports the system. Because Social Security uh, is dependent on payroll taxes. Payroll taxes are dependent on workers' wages. Workers' wages are dependent on the health uh, and productivity of the U.S. economy. Um, essentially, if you keep a healthy economy going uh, and provide for people and provide for a more skilled population in the future, you can take care of these things. But if you start to obsess about the future, you start to think, oh my God, we've got to cut everything or we're not going to be able to afford this. And that becomes a kind of a dead end. And that's where Washington is these days, unfortunately. Talk about financial repression. <laughs> well, that's since, since 2008. Federal Reserve has kept interest rates down to nearly nothing. Mm -hmm. What will, will there be? The current forecast is to keep, to keep the interest rates back down to this low, probably until 2015, 2016, something like that. Mm -hmm. Will that have any effect on the viability of Social Security? 
It will to the extent that the Treasury bonds that are in the trust fund don't pay as much. The Fed could issue Treasury bonds to Social Security that pay a little more. Uh, this, uh, this is the banking system. There's always a way to finesse these things. Yeah, thank you. They're great questions, by the way. It was really rewarding to me.